Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com. And welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio, and joining us on the Newsmaker line right now is a former WCW, WWE, and GWF star, and it's a true pleasure to have him on, a second-generation superstar, the one and only Scott Putsky. Scott, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Thank you very much, man. It's good to be here, buddy. Well, it's great to have you on the show. I don't know if anybody on the air knows the uh, the backstory, but I've been dying to get you on. I, I like to do interviews with people like yourself who I think really have a great story to tell. And, you know, I told you, and I don't lie to people, when I told you I was a fan of your work and GWF and uh, WWF and WCW, I really was. So it's great to finally get you on the show. We've been doing this nine years. So it's great to have you on. Wow, that's it's an honor to be here, bro. All righty. So I guess the first question we got to ask you is, since WCW ended, and I know you did some work uh, on the independents, but what are you up to these days? What's Scott Putsky doing these days? Well, I'm just taking it easy. You know, I'm, I'm in between Fort Worth and Dallas and just, uh, you know, just living the life now, just trying to take care of myself. I'm training. Actually, I'm in better shape now than I ever was. And, uh, you know, i got a, a young son that's playing football now in junior high and just, just working with him and, and getting him into work and, you know, weights and stuff like my father got me into and uh, just just enjoying life, really, man, riding my motorcycle and just having a good time. Very good. So we were talking a little bit about you uh, on the, in the show leading up to this one, and we said it's kind of nice to have a refreshing story about a wrestler because a lot of times you talk about, you know, the movie The Wrestler and all the guys are kind of down and out after wrestling and all that, and it seems like you're kind of the, the buck of the trend there. You're not quite in that position. Oh, no, 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 no. You know... I was never into drugs. I was never a big drinker or partier. I was, you know, just like my dad. I was, you know, into working out and, and taking care of my body. And I mean, it showed. There's, you know, you got guys that, that took care of themselves and guys that, you know, had a good time. And then you got guys that did both. But I was just lucky growing up in the business. You know, I knew. And at, at a young age, I was told by my father, once I finally smartened up, well, I wouldn't say young shit. I didn't smarten up to this business until I was probably in high school or out of high school. I mean, up to that point, I thought wrestling was a shoot, which it was, you know, to a degree then. I mean, it's a lot more, but shoot, it's, it's, it was an MMA style work back then as opposed to a total show like it is now. But so like my father's father always said, you know, and, and this has stuck with me and I think it needs to stick with every wrestler or any of the boys in the business. Once you start believing your gimmick, you're dead. You're done. Yeah, then that, that's that's true. And I mean, we just saw—I don't want to name names or name drop or anything—but we just saw on ESPN just a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, the Scott Hall story. And I don't think anybody didn't kind of feel sick to their stomach after watching that one. Uh, I love Scotty to death. I mean, what a first-class guy. I mean, as a friend, the guy was was first class. I mean, I love Scotty to death, and I have nothing negative to say about him. You know, it's a, it's a tragedy what what's happened. You know, but like like everything else, we don't know the whole story, and we, you know. It, you know, judge unless he be judged. So I don't, yeah. you know, judge Scott Hall. I know him, and I can honestly say that, you know, in my lifetime, I've met and I've seen some of the greatest wrestlers in professional wrestling, and Scott Hall is definitely one of the top five as far as a worker and entertainer that I've ever been around in my life. I mean, you're talking from, from like we were talking earlier, Bruno San Martino, superstar Billy Graham, Jimmy Snuka, I can tell you that Scott Hall was one of the top five workers and on the mic of everybody I've ever met in the world of professional wrestling. And you know what? I think I would have to agree. Talent-wise, you know, he's one of those guys who just never realized his potential. He, he had so much more potential than he ever Well, he did, but he was, he, was, he was the NWO. Scott Hall was the mouthpiece of the NWO. Without Scott Hall, the NWO wouldn't have been shit. I mean, pardon my French, but... In my opinion, he was the NWO. The NWO was Scott Hall. That was Scott Hall. That wasn't Kevin Nash or Hulk Hogan or any any of the other guys. NWO was Scott Hall, period. He's the one who made it cool. Well, hey, hello, James. Let's go. Oh, by the way, yeah, Patrick Kelly, by the way, uh, my, my third co-host is on the line with us as well. Patrick, uh, this is Scott Putsky, if you didn't know. <laughs> What's up, bud? But, yeah, I mean, just like... I'm doing fine. How you doing, sir? The, the, Good. Look at all the past shows. I mean, take Scott Hall out of the equation, and it's it's it's, it's a boring gimmick. Mm. Yeah, I think you can. And you know, WWE tried to do it in 2002, and granted, it had to use a uh, television term, "jump the shark." At that point, anyway, right. um, you know, it still was nothing without him in it. No, I think you could say that's true. 
Uh, Carl was the NWO. That was the NWO. He and, I mean, without a doubt, was the NWO. Oh, jump back. Speaking of Scott Hall, that also reminds me of when WWE, after he left, they tried to resurrect Razor Ramon without him, and that obviously didn't work. <laughs> wow, that's a joke. I mean, hey, you can often imitate, but you can never duplicate. Yeah. So, for someone like you, growing up in the second generation, I mean, your father, WWE Hall of Famer, was there big shoes for you to fill, or did, did you feel comfortable getting in there and, and assuming the Putsky name? I, I, I felt comfortable. I mean, whether, you know, the, the office wanted me to be comfortable or wanted to make it comfortable for me was a different, you know, monstrosity in itself. I mean, my dad and Vince McMahon, have, had he goes way back from, you know, when his dad was there. Vince Sr. loved my father, and then my father loved Vince Sr. I mean, you know, my father speaks of, of, of Vince senior like a dad i mean he was like a father to him and you know took care of dad and, and everything was done on a handshake and a, a promise you know if my dad said dad always told me he said you know i shook vince man senior's hand he calls vince vince and vince junior benny he said i shook vince's hand and he knew i was going to be there i, I t- came to a town you know told him i'd be at the town and i was there you know, and if I needed time off, I, he would give me time off. If I needed this, he would do that. If he told me something or told anybody something. And he tells a story one time of, of I mean, I'm not going to say any name, but he tells a story one time, you know, they're in the, in the back and he's telling someone, that, you know, you've got to do this job because this is how this angle is going to work. And, and in the end, after da 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 da, we're giving you the strap. And so that time came and it didn't appear that, you know, and, that the guy was going to get the strap. Well, he went to Vince and said, Vince, remember you told me, da 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 Vince said, you're right, and gave him the strap that night. He said, wow. that's what an honorable man Vince Sr. was. Wow. And my, like I said, Vince Sr., my dad has will never say an ill word. He will. Be, I mean, if, if anyone ever said anything bad about Vince Sr., dad would come after you like a little Tasmanian devil. But he doesn't quite have that same love for Vince Jr. then. No, not at all. Not at all. You know, and I mean, it's obvious. You saw that. I mean, it's it's the same thing putting me in the light heavyweight division when I was there. I was 240 pounds. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was the cut off, one that cut off 150, and Sean, I mean, nothing against Sean Michaels, great worker, but, I mean, I think I had about 40 pounds on Sean. <laughs> That's probably true. I mean, Well, you know what? The WWE, they've never really been good with the cruiserweight division, so, Yeah. That's never been one of the. Well, I mean, but the thing is, is I wasn't a cruiserweight. I was two forty. What's I mean, you know, and I, I, I know Ray and and Hoobie and I love those guys to death. They're a buck twenty, buck thirty, buck forty, you know, on a good day, and that's a cruiserweight. Cruiserweight's more of a lucha libre style mm-hmm. match anyway. And you know, going back to the cruiserweight, the the most phenomenal, two most phenomenal cruiserweights were when Ray and Hoobie would work in WCW. And if you ever saw, I mean, you've seen those guys work. After you see oh, those yeah. guys work, there's there you can't watch another cruiserweight match because, I mean, nothing else can compare to that. You can't even come close to working a match like these two guys did. They were phenomenal. I mean, acrobats, wrestling. I mean, everything was so phenomenal because they were both equal. I think Hoobie Hoob, was as good or better than Ray, but he just had his little attitude, which which I liked. But um, you know, you couldn't. Once those guys stepped in the ring, nobody you couldn't compete with it, and in that you know cruiserweight style match. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, you were part of that whole movement by the WWE to try to match WCW's cruiserweight division because you know the cruiserweight division had taken off and was so popular right. with the fans. Did you feel? Obviously, you did based on what you just said that that you were kind of misplaced there. You didn't belong in the cruiserweight division then. Right, and I don't think I did, you know, and I don't know why, why he, I mean, I, I can do, could do things that, you know, I'm a totally different entity than my father was, but I just, it was just, it was, it took me out of my element and, and just kind of, you know, it was weird. It was just, it was weird to me, and, and it just, it, to me, it just didn't work for me. I mean, and that, that's not the reason why I left or anything, but it just, which was the worst mistake I ever did, but, I just, I just never felt comfortable in that division having to do, you know, or, or attempt to do all that stuff that, that wasn't natural to me. What was the reason that you left? I tore my quad in the pay-per-view with Brian Christopher when in that In Your House uh, pay-per-view in Louisville. 
<clears throat> and so I was out for a couple months, and when I when I got back and I was ready to come back, I you know contacted Bruce and Vince, and you know, and they're just like, well, we don't have nothing for you now, blah blah blah, blah blah blah, and kind of just put me on the back burner instead of trying to work me into something. Which the angle was, I mean, honestly, I think the angle with me and Brian was a hot deal, and could have really turned out to be something really good. You know, his dad being Jerry Lawler, dad being the, you know, and. Uh, he, they just kind of put me on the back burners and put me on the back burners, weren't doing nothing with me, weren't doing nothing with me. And I was really good friends with, with uh, DDP, and uh, DDP was always trying to get me up to, to WCW. He was like, brother, you got to come up here, man. You need to come work up here. They're, you know, paying, da 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 So finally, you know, we I was talking with DDP, and I was like, man, you know, they really don't have goes, Well, just ask them for your release, man, and, you know. So I called up there, and I talked to Bruce, and Bruce, you know, said he talked to Vince, and, and, uh, yeah, I mean, they said, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I thought I had left on good terms. So I didn't, you know, think there was any heat there that, that, uh, I mean, obviously there was, but, you know, if you're somewhere and you have a family and you're trying to feed your family and you're not making any money and then you got an opportunity to go somewhere and, and you're pretty much stealing money. We work Tuesday, mo- Mondays and Thursdays and they send us a check every week for this ungodly amount of money. I mean, what would you have done? <laughs> well, exactly. And, oh, you know, I agree with you entirely. And, you know, when you went to WCW, we had Barry Horowitz on uh, fairly recently. And, yeah, he's one of those guys, similar to yourself, that in WWE they used him for a while and they dropped him like a bad habit. And then he went to WCW and he was just a body and and they were just there. And, you know, if you really sat down and made a list of the entire roster that WCW had under contract in, say, 1998 – you're talking about perhaps the best roster that wrestling has ever seen. The only problem was like 90% of them weren't doing anything. Right, and the thing was is while while NWO had taken off and run its course and they were they were beating that horse to death and that was all they were, that was their show. I mean, if you look back, NWO was in every segment, every 10 minutes they were coming out beating somebody up, squashing somebody. And Vince at the time, which 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 WCW had taken the talent from Vince, his, his main event talent, and here's here's Vince McMahon being the genius he is in wrestling. You know, you got to give him that. He's building new talent because he knows down the road those are the guys that are gonna you know take over. While WCW is just taking all their talent, young talent, and squashing it, and just you know doing nothing with it. And it's just like, you know, it's in football. Eventually, I'm a big Steeler fan. Eventually, Ben Roethlisberger is going to become obsolete, and there's going to have to be a guy this groom behind him that's going to have to come in and take his spot. And when it's that time comes, just as in wrestling, you got to pass the torch. None of these guys wanted to pass the torch. Kevin Nash, Hulk Hogan, none of these guys wanted to pass the torch to the younger guys. The same same freaking torch that was passed to them, they didn't want to pass to somebody else. It would be like, to, to use Steeler terms, it would be like if uh, Terry Bradshaw decided he wanted to just play one more game. I'd love right. him to death, but he'd probably get killed. So. Right. But, I mean, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, a real sport. Thanks. You know, yeah. and they didn't want it. They, it the business, like I said, this, my, and that goes back to what my father always said. Once you start to believe your gimmick, you're dead, you're done. These guys believe that they're these tough guys, that they're this, you know. Can they really do this in real life? I doubt it, you know. <laughs> but the point is, is well, you pass the torch, it's a show, and, and it needs to continue to be a show, and people know it's a show. You know, it's, now it's a show. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the biggest work in the business. And and back in the day when Dad and them were, it was more like MMA is. I mean, it was more of a, you know, believable sport. You know, the moves were more realistic. And in order for wrestling to really survive, in my opinion, and opinions are like assholes, everybody's got one, <laughs> I think wrestling needs to go back to the reality of, of uh, like an MMA style. Wrestling. I've been saying that for probably, what, five years now, Patrick? In, and I'm not a big MMA oh, yeah. guy. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a big right. MMA guy, but the writing is clearly on the wall. Well, it's got to be a stiff work. Until they go back to a stiff work, it ain't going to work. It's not going to work. The business will die. I mean, it's, you know, and you've got to get guys that are more believable. And, I, you know, I don't really watch it, so I can't say, but it's got to go back to to the day of, of believing. I mean, the little I do see, it's just like, man, this is so hokey. It's, it's, it's almost comical. It's more comedy than it is realism. And, and that's yeah. what it's Oh, I was watching like, SmackDown before I called into the line here, and they're doing like a Christmas show, and I'm thinking, okay, it's it's November, it's not it's not, <laughs> not not even really close to Christmas time. 
And it's been, right. like, the most ridiculous thing I've ever watched. Well, but, I mean, and that's it. It's got to be, you know, it's got to be intense. It's got to be, uh, you know, it's got to be to the point. And, and, I mean, I we still, it's like we did that gimmick. I don't know if you ever saw that gimmick, the Cowboys from Hell. We, yeah. me and Cedric, this buddy of mine, we actually had the rights to use that name and the music because we knew Dimebag and, and Vinny, you know, God bless Dimebag, love him. God bless Dimebag, Dimebag absolutely. absolutely. Man, what a, what a sweetheart of a guy. But you knew him? He used to, oh, dude, we were buddies. He was the one. He gave us the gimme. He's like, brother, y'all are the, the fucking cowboys from hell. Y'all fucking light it up, brother. Y'all got, y'all, blah, blah, blah. you know, Jack Daniels. Oh, we come out with the Jack Daniels bottles. And, but the thing is, is we did, what we did was real. We actually had the dudes in the back believing that what we were doing was a shoot. I mean, nobody would have wanted to work with us. We had a handful of guys, and when we were, when we'd work with them, we'd pull them aside and say, look, dude, you know, we're not going to hurt you. This shit, what we do is the biggest fucking work. We're going to chop you. You're going to feel our chops. Believe me. Your chest is going to be red, and it, it, it possibly could turn purple and brown from us chopping you so fucking hard, but you won't be hurt. We won't drop you on your head. You know, our power bombs don't hurt. My ass hurts more than your back does. You know, my this, I'm going to drop you to a table, and I'm going to take the blunt of the, the, the thing. You're not going to feel anything. And these guys would, you know, when we were down there, just like, man, you know, thank you, brother. I'd look, we'd go, dude, go to the back and fucking sell the shit out of this. And so the, the guys in the back hated us. I mean, and nobody wanted to work with us. But it was a work. And, it, I mean, it was so good that the guys in the back believed our work. I just got up. I talked to, you know, you know Black Bart, don't you? Actually, we interviewed Black Bart back in 2007, and it was like a mark out moment him again. at that time. Ask, interview Bart again. I saw Bart at a shootout not too long ago. And he still, to this day, he says, you boy, and I'm going to do my perfect Bart, Bartski. I call him Bartski. <laughs> Putsky, you some bitch, you used to fuck me. You hurt them boys. You would hurt them boys. And I was like, Bart, man, it was a freak. Don't you tell me it's a work. Don't you tell me it's a work. Putsky, I've seen it with my own eyes what you've done. But he, I, you know, and I would tell him, I'd say, Bart, it's a, we, they didn't tell, he goes, son, you can tell me, talk to your blue in the face, and I still won't believe it. Wow. I mean, we even freaking bark. I mean, he'll tell you that. He'll tell you that. Ask him if our Cowboys from Hell gimmick say he's, I, we talked to Putsky and he said it was a total work. It wasn't a shoot. And he swears it's a shoot. Oh, wow. But that's, and we didn't do, we did, I mean, we did things, but we didn't flip. We didn't flop. But what we did, we made believable. And that's what was our intention of going in and doing this. When we started, we said, you know, everybody's doing all this Lucha Libre bullshit, flying around, doing all this crazy high spot stuff. Let's just go out and chop meat and make them think that we're beating the shit out of these kids. Just kind of like you, you were kind of like the modern-day road warriors. Right. And I was just thinking the exactly. same thing. But that's what we were, and that's what we used to, we used to pat. We, me and Cedric always said, you know what we are? We're, we are uh, Rob Zomb- where Rob Zombie meets Barnum and Bailey, and that's what we went out there and did. <laughs> oh. That was our thing. We're the cow- cowboy from hell. We're Rob Zombie where Rob Zombie and Barnum and Bailey met. That would be us. That was, that was what we were. And that's, that was our attitude and it was, it was just funny. And it was, you know, and it, it, I, to not get picked up by Vince, even Bart, cause Bart used to watch, he was here as a Dallas, uh, promotion and it was, we were on that TV every Saturday and Bart watched the shit out. It was PCW and he never could figure it out. But it was just, you know, one of those things that you know, it could be he didn't own the name Cowboys from Hell cause Pantera did and, and didn't want to go with it. Who, who owned the name Cowboys from Hell? Cowboys from Hell is Pantera. He is owned by. Oh Pantera. yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. They own it. That's theirs. Yeah, that's their trademark. But they allowed us. They they were saying, brother, if you want to take that, you know, we'll sign off anything you need us to sign off on. I mean, that was our music. We came out to. We had freaking cowboy hats with devil horns on them, and just came out drinking <laughs> now, Jack Daniels. This sounds so tailor made for for WWE television. Was that ever even in the cards or in the well, discussion? Well, uh, Michael Hayes came down a couple times. You know, for what we don't know, and uh, I don't know. You know, whatever happened happened, and 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 that's just the end of it. But it was, it was. I mean, this was actually the, one of the greatest, in my opinion, one of the greatest gimmicks that could have came out. But like I said, we were just we were dudes that just didn't give a shit. Did you see what I had the long kind of goatee beard, about six inch beard, and Cedric? I shaved my head, and Cedric had long hair and the goatee beard. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, we weren't like, like, uh, you know, I love Marty Giannetti and Shawn Michaels, but we weren't like the rockers. We didn't look alike. We were, you know, it was rock and roll. One dude had his head shaved, the other dude had long, crazy hair. That's very cool. You know, we didn't try to look alike, but we, we did our thing and that was it. And 
we we took it to the to extreme, and that's what we said. Let's let's go out there and just do something different. Let's make it look real, <laughs> you know. I mean, that was our whole premise. Let's just make it look real. No matter what we do, let's make it look real. And we tell them, dude, you're, these chops we lay on you, it's going to hurt. We're going to chop you till buttermilk squirts out your butthole, but you're, we're not going to hurt you in any other way. <laughs> oh, wow. So it, that's that's said and done, though. No, that's not going anywhere. That, that's... Well, we do it. We do it every now and then. We still we've done a couple shows, you know, here and there. But it's just, you know, we don't want to do. I, I mean, I'm at the point now is I don't want to do this smaller stuff, you know, a whole lot. And it's just it's not me. I just, you know, I've been to once you've worked for Vince and 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 you worked in WCW. It's just hard, man, to do these independent shows like that. You know, if it was a, if it was something that we were coming back and we had to work our way back through, and there was a, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel, but there's not. You know, he's not going to take that. I mean, he doesn't. He's not going to use us, and it's 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 a it's a dead issue. Yeah, that's right. So, um, I have a couple of other questions for you about about WCW actually, and we were talking about basically you just collecting a check and all that. Did did you guys, as the level that you were basically being presented as? Were you guys basically just viewing it as this is just, you know, ride it out and, and get the money out of this? Because it seemed to me like the writing was on the wall that they was like maybe 12 guys that they were going to use heavily and the rest of them. Oh, yeah, the exactly, day. exactly. And had they not been paying us so well and the, the gig was so easy, I mean, there would have been a lot of guys that said, F you, you know, I'm out of here. But, I mean, it was almost, you know, I, I felt guilty to have some, every two weeks a check came in the mail and it was just like, you know, you just kind of felt felt guilty for cashing that check, but then you were like, "Screw them!" And it was, you know, it was almost like illegal. You know what I mean? It was, it was, it was like a legal way of stealing. I, honestly, and I, I and I tell people this all the time. It's just like I, I'd get the check and I'd kind of look around, thinking, "Shit, is someone going to come arrest me and you know take my money?" Because this, like, really, and you know, and I grew up in this business where you know, Dad had to travel seven days a week, and they drove to town to town and. And here I am, I'm flying in and flying out, and, you know, we get our ticket on Friday for Monday. It was a joke, dude. It was a freaking joke. We'd get a FedEx package on sometimes on Saturday for Monday. And sometimes they'd call and they'd go, Putsky, where are you at? And I was like, well, one time in Syracuse, they're in Syracuse, and it's, it's 10.30, 11 o'clock, and they're like, well, where are you at, Putsky? I'm like, well, I didn't get a ticket. So I assumed I wasn't on the show. <laughs> no, and so Terry Taylor's bumming around trying to figure it out. He called me back about an hour later, which is about 1 o'clock. He goes, we got an e-ticket for you. We need you in Syracuse now. I'm like, all right, cool. So I'm thinking, well, shit, finally they got something for me. They're going to do something. I get to Syracuse. I come in, got my stuff, you know, come straight from the airport with the rental car, park, get in, run run inside, uh, look on the board. My name's not on the board. I'm like, Terry, what's up? He's like, oh, never mind, man. We don't need you anymore. I was like, all right, dude. I just went, drove back to the airport, checked on, you know, back when you didn't have to pay a <laughs> ticket. And I just threw my shit on and. And it got to the point where we uh, we worked Mondays and Thursdays. We were, you know, of course, they're going to put all of us non-12 guys on early. And we would basically come from the airport to the show, do the promos, whatever we had to do, not get a hotel. Because if we could get on early enough, we'd just drive back to the airport, get on a plane, and catch a red eye home. And being, you know, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area at the time, I, I – uh, Dude, there was red eyes coming in all the time to DFW. So no matter where I was, I could catch a, you know, as long as it wasn't, I could get on a plane by 11 o'clock, I was home that, that next morning. Wow. That's and didn't have to go back out till Thursday because we ran no home, no house shows. We ran, we were TV company. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So it was, I mean, how could you, how could, you know, you felt bad and I, you know, yes, you know, from a standpoint of wrestling, I wanted more. But it was just like, wow, I'm providing all this for my family, and I'm home all the time. I'm home every day. I mean, I may leave for a couple hours, but I'm coming right back. I may go to L.A., you know, and it's just like I say. I'll be like, uh, I might be home tonight. I might be home tomorrow, and I'll let you know. So wow. that's just the way. And that's the only reason I really tolerated it. But as far as the biggest mistake career-wise I ever made was leaving WWF or WWE. Wow. I still call them WWF. They'll always be WWF to me. Do you think that? Uh, well, I mean, I guess, like I said, you had the look that you, that you know they thought they would love you with. Um, I right. Thought, it didn't look like a cruiserweight, but then again, we've already covered that. Right. Um, so I mean, you got to think that at some point they would have given you something. And they would have. I honestly believe Vince would have eventually done something because he's a businessman. And I mean, no matter what he is, he's a businessman. I mean, and I was there, and you know, and they, I'm sure they would have. 
you know, done whatever they had to do as far as making me, you know, pay, pay my dues, whatever it was, which I gladly would do. I mean, you know, I went to Mexico and I went to Japan and I went to, uh, to a lot of, went through a lot of shit as compared to these guys now, these second generation, third generation wrestlers. I mean, I went to Mexico and ran the route in Mexico for a while. And then I went to Japan and worked for war. And I mean, it, as far that was as learning. a crazy place to work. Oh, it was great. But I'm telling you, I learned more there under Kenru and those guys than, uh, anybody. I mean, that, that was, I mean, you worked a, worked a 15, 20 minute match full tilt every night. And I mean, I honestly, the first, and this is shoot, the first night, the first time I ever went to Japan was I worked for war. Me, Bob Backlin, and, um, Terry, uh, Warlord were, uh, the first six man champions with Warhead from America. And uh the first night I'm there, I'm working singles, and I tear my groin. I fucking tear my groin, pardon my language, but I tear my groin. My whole leg is black and blue. I worked two weeks with the torn groin the very first time I went to Japan. You know, you don't get baby down there. You just go. It's either, you know, put up or shut up down there. You fight for your life, and you fight for your earnings, which I didn't mind. You think these guys now would do that? Prima donna? <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> I tore my groin. I tore my groin. I got to go home. There you go. It's probably it. Now, do you yeah. think that that's what's missing in the business today? Is that now you get these developmental territories? They they learn to work WWE style. They get nothing else. And right, there. right. The territory they got to go. I mean, that's what killed the business was when it they took territories away. But I mean, you gotta you gotta learn. I mean, I just I I don't know how to say it. And the only way I can say it is until it becomes more of a shoot, it's not going to work. I mean, we can I can sit here and shoot with you verbally as much as I want, and it's funny and it's entertaining. But unless we get out there and go hand to hand combat, yep, and make people believe that we're actually pissed off at each other, it's it's the equivalent of you and your brother going out and you slap box, y'all. You slap box, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, of course. Yeah. Okay, you sitting there with your buddy, your brother, whatever, y'all are playing around slap boxing. All of a sudden, someone slaps the crap out of someone, you know, accidentally, but not accidentally. And you know, you kind of stop and go, "Hey, man!" And then, pow! He slaps you accidentally, but not accidentally. All of a sudden, now here's pow! pow there's two more slaps, and if you're, then you're into it. Yeah. And people are, you're fine. And that's what you got. This business has got to get into. It's like, okay, we know it to work, and and that was our premise with the Cowboys from Hell. Is we know it to work, but dude, I don't think these two guys are working. I don't think somebody told them that it's to work because they're knocking the piss out of these guys. <laughs> you know, they're really hitting them, and we weren't. You know. And it's it's just like, you know, a punch. I was always taught if you can't feel a punch, don't sell it. If you can't feel a punch, don't sell it. I don't mean, you know, feel a punch, pull tilt, but you've got to touch them. You've got to touch somebody. And if they can't take take that, then they don't need to be in the business. I mean, it's football. I play football. I played football with TCU, and then I went, you know, had the, the, the honor of going to Houston Oilers and trying out with them, but I tore my Achilles heel. But the thing is, is, Back in the day, most of the guys were athletes, ex-athletes, football players, you know, something like that, wrestlers or, or something. So it was, mm-hmm. you know, it was just they were used to that that type of punishment. But it goes back to, again, like you said, WWF has their territory and they teach them their style. Well, it's just like Lucha Libre. If you watch Lucha Libre all the time, that shit gets boring. You watch Vince's stuff. you got to mix and match. you got to have midgets. you got to have, you know, high-flying matches. you got to have... You know, the big, uh, and it's got to go back. Everybody looks alike. Everybody looks exactly like everybody wears black boots and black trunks right now, right? Everybody's took stole the oh, yeah. cold steel ball. And they all wrestle the same match. I actually said that the other day. I said uh, there was two guys wrestling. I don't even remember who it was. I think it was Miz and somebody. And I turned around and said to my wife, they must have had a sale on black tights somewhere. Right. But remember, it went from the, it went from the, the 80s, the bright, and early 90s, the bright, you know, neon, uh, disco colored <laughs> steel airbrush shit to everybody's wearing black trunks and black boots. You know, before it was who who could make the coolest costume? Who could have the, the craziest, you know, glam rock costume? Then it went to everybody, Stone Cold made black tights and black boots fashionable. And so now everybody wears black tights and black boots. you got to go back. You've got to have your cowboy. You've got to have your Indian. You've got to have your Polak. You've got to have your Japanese guy. You got to have your Russian. You know your typical stereotypical Russian. You've got to have your 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 Hispanic guy. You've got to have your black guy. You've got to have your um you know because everybody's got a favorite. Everybody's got an ethnicity. You got to have your your you know just down the line, down the line, down the line of of characters instead of 
at mass producing one character, you know, a hundred different ways. There you go. I mean, it's, it, am I not, is, I mean, do, don't you agree with me? We gotta go back to, like I said, you've gotta have, you know, your Irish guy, your, you know, your Swedish guy, your this, your that, you know. Well, that was, you know, and like I said, I grew up in New Jersey. I was like the, the same county as the George Washington Bridge. So, right. you know, I'm basically in the heart of New York, which is WWF country. And growing I up, lived there for a while. I lived right there on 75th and Riverside. Oh, wow. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I know exactly, um, you know, I know exactly what you mean. And, and our area up there was so diverse. And that, back when your father was there, that's, that, that's right. what they played to. And, right. you know, now that they're a national company, you got different pockets. Like, I'm sure in your area, the same as in mine, you got a very hard, a very large Mexican. Uh, follow well, up. that, yeah. but we, it's not even that, but some of them, you know, it's, it's your characters. You, even, even though that's, they're Hispanic, they may like the Oriental style guy wrestling. They may like the crazy Russian guy with his Russian, you know, they may like the Nazi guy. They may like the <laughs> cowboy guy. They may like the Indian guy. We don't know. We can't say. But you throw all that crap out there, someone's got to like something about that, right? I think so, and and I mean, instead of having everybody, it'd be like just putting uh, Miley Crew out there, and everybody, you know, back in the day, the music. I mean, it's, again, it's 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 like that all around the world. I mean, in every entity, look at the music today. You put on a song, and you got to listen to it, and they go, "Well, who the hell is that?" And they go, "Oh, well, that's so and so." Yeah. Back in the day, you played Led Zeppelin. You knew it was Led Zeppelin. You played ACDC. You knew it was Led ACDC. You, you know, they throw a couple uh, licks down, and you knew it. Kiss, Kiss you're, came out. Judas Priest. You're you singing know, my, Halen. you're singing my genre right here, man. You're like, right, great. I'm saying Van, Van <laughs> Halen. You know, yeah. Cheap Trick. I mean, they play yeah. a couple riffs, and and you're like, dude, Cheap Trick. I, I want you to want me. You, know, you just fine. But I mean, they had their sound, and their sound was different from Van Halen's sound. And Van Halen's sound was different than Molly Cruz's sound. Molly Crew's sound was different than, you know, I mean, I like Rob Zombie, Rob Zombie sound. Rob Zombie comes on, you know, it's Rob Zombie. Yeah, it's different than anything else that's out there. But everything else out there is the same. It's all mass produced on a computer and it's... it's, that's, it's but the, now you turn it on and then you sound 75 different bands that sound exactly the same as Right, Michael it's Mack. a cookie cutter mold. It's a cookie cutter mold and that's what wrestling's become, a cookie cutter mold. Until there's individuals in this business that are totally individuals, and you, you know, know what? Every one of those bands that you just mentioned, unless they're unless they're dead, right. they're still on the road and they're still oh, touring. And they're still Look touring. at Aerosmith. I love Aerosmith. You know, exactly. and, and these guys, you know, could outsell any of these little punk bands today. You know, but that's what Vince. And then I mean, and then again, theories are like assholes. Everybody's got one. That's my theory. I think <laughs> that you need to go back to, you know, different. <laughs> you got to have different personalities. There's in the business today. There's there's three personalities. And it's all rolled into one. You want me to tell you the three personalities are? Sure, and they're all those? Those. Absolutely. Stone Cold, mm-hmm. Undertaker, and The Rock. And they're rolled into one. Those three, there's someone stealing something from one of those three, and that's all they're using. And you could probably you argue that. I, I would tend to agree with that. Those three guys, that's it. They're I, I do want to ask you guys. one thing about a modern situation that happened. And it's not really <laughs> disbelief so much mm-hmm. as it was the first time in at least a decade that the mainstream paid attention to wrestling, and I think they actually bought it. And that's when CM Punk won the world title. Mm-hmm. TMZ, who I think everybody knows who TMZ is. They're yeah, the paparazzi. Yeah, I, watch up. I love that stuff. I watch that shit at night. They <laughs> followed him around at the airport with the WWF title and were coaxing him into bashing the company because they believed, hook, line, and sinker, they believed that he had quit the company with the championship belt and told them they were a bunch of assholes. Right. They believed it. And that's the first time in at least a decade that I think that anything that resembled mainstream publicity actually believed that it was more than just a, you know, cartoonish wasteland. Hey, but you may tell you something. I guarantee you Vince had a hand in it. They knew exactly what they were doing, and Vince freaking oh, yeah. minded that whole thing and made everybody believe it. And Vince and TMZ were in that together, I guarantee you. It was a work between with both those guys' knowledge of um, knowing exactly what was going on. Harvey Levin knew exactly what he was doing, and, and I wouldn't, it, it wouldn't pass my, pass my thought process of saying he was up in Stamford, Connecticut with Vince setting that shit up. <laughs> it's very possible. It's no, very I mean, Vince is a smart guy. That's why I don't understand why he, he's, he's, he's put himself in this situation. I mean, he's a genius. You gotta give him that. 
Oh, so you yeah. give the guy his props. He's he's a genius in this business. But you know, it's it's like he lets it go on and lets other people do things when he should be actually doing doing it himself. Whether he and, and he may be, and he may have gotten so disillusioned with himself in the business yeah. that he, he's so too far gone. Is it but, possible though? We mentioned all these bands, the, the Motley Crues, the ACDCs, and all them, and right. you know, all of them have put out albums of late, and some of them are pretty good, some oh, yeah. of them are not so good. Right. And, and you know, it's the situation where maybe creative, creatively, maybe creatively he's shot, maybe creatively he's just out of ideas and he needs somebody to... Well, I think what he's done, he's, he's let the, these these uh, these uh, movie actors and all this, this uh, Hollywood producers and Hollywood script writers write this script. You can't ride the wrestling, you know, and that's one thing about wrestling, and, and I do know this. I grew up in this business, you know, and I, and I know it like I know the back of my hand. I know the psychology of this business. You can't, if me and you are working, I cannot, we cannot set out a match and say, okay, here's the match, and, and this is what these guys do now. They set the match out move for move from start to finish, correct? That's about, that's what I hear, yeah. Okay. We're in a town, we, we, we're in a town, and we've set this match up. So we know it move for move, we've done it, da 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 da. Well, what happens if this town at that time doesn't want that type of what we're doing? You know, you go to you go to different places and at different times, and you know you yourself are a witness to that. You know what you like. You may want some type of comedy. You may not want some type of comedy. You may not want high spots. You may want somebody chopping me. You know, you may get a bigger pop from a big power slam. You may get a bigger chop from doing a Ric Flair face bump. There you you know, you can't you can't set out a match and say, okay, this is our match, and the people are going to like it. This is the, this is our opening spot. This is our heat spot. This is our comeback spot. This is our finish. You've got four sets. Let's fill in the rest in the, on, on the fly. That's how we did it. Let's fill in the rest on the fly. We didn't, we, you know, and that's how I was taught. Because you go to a different place. They may not want uh, uh, off the off the uh, top rope, triple flip Lindy, double Lindy, whatever. They, <laughs> they may want, you know, a clothesline. They may right. pop more on a clothesline that, that looks realistic. They may pop more on a forearm to the face. You know, they may not want, uh, you know, a spinning back kick, back flip or something. Right. They may want that. Then they may. And so, okay, we've set out this match. We can't change it because this is what we've called. We don't know how to fill in these spots anymore. So you're stuck. There you go. And that's, that's what's happened. You go to different places. The, you, <clears throat> and what I always thought, you know, and, and, and I mean, and it, it goes on a bigger scale. Once you get over more, it, it's easier to do. But the point is, is, you don't know what the people want. I mean, Hoovy and Ray could get out there and do these phenomenal things. I mean, these just just a mind blowing moves. And Goldberg would give a guy a shoulder and stick his tongue out, and the place would pop the same. That's the I idea. mean, Hoovy and Ray put their put their life on the line for these these matches. And and I love Bill Goldberg. What a great guy, you know. And and that was his deal. But I mean, you can't tell me that's what they want. You don't know what they want. Hmm. You don't know what these people want. You got to give them what they want. You can't tell them what they want, and that's the problem. Is they're telling them now? They're going, okay, we're going to. This is our match, and we're going to dictate it like this, and this is what they like. I think it was kind of. If you saw last night's edition of Raw, Roddy Piper was kind of on Cena, kind of trying to tell that story to him. Right, and that's the thing. But you look at it. I didn't see it, but I mean, the thing is, is you look at at matches, and and, uh, unless they're piping in cheers, you you look at the people. They're just sitting on their ass, and they're sitting on their hands. Largely, that is, and, and you know what? That, that's what you're seeing a lot these days. There's a lot of piped-in noise, right? And boring. You hear the boring song thing. You hear the this. You hear the that. Yep. I mean, who cares if they bring a sign in? Let them bring a sign in and and start some type of controversy. There you controversy go. sells. Absolutely. Controversy sells. Let these people enjoy themselves. I mean, this is what they come for. You know, if if they don't like your main event guy, make the guy work and like him. That's what they used to have to do in the day. I mean, I and and one of the greatest. Greatest workers I ever got to work with and see work was uh oh uh dang what's his name um his kid ended up well I don't know if it was his real kid uh damn I can't think of his name right off my um and I worked with him in in uh, global when I first started uh, oh. Dicky Murdoch Dicky Murdoch Dick Murdoch Dick Murdoch okay oh this guy could have you and and I witnessed this firsthand as a kid and as a worker this guy would have you. 
pissed off. He'd have you cheering him. He'd have you hating him. He'd have you cheering him on, wanting him to make a big comeback. He'd have him hating him. He'd have you booing him. He'd have him you calling him boring all in the course of about five minutes. <laughs> the guy was a genius. I mean, a genius. And it, it, could, it didn't have to be a movie. It could be a face expression. It could yeah. be a hand expression. It could have been a no expression. And Trevor I mean, Murdoch, guy, by the way, he's, he's not his son. He's a great right, guy, but he, he's not yeah, his yeah. son. But, he's a, but, but he looks but like him. Dick, but dude, Dickie, I, and I witnessed that firsthand in five minutes. I've seen emotions change ten times in the crowd, and it was all his doing. And it, it wasn't a big something. It was just something he did. It could, like I said, it was a face. It was a move. It was a, just a hand gesture. It was a, you know, just anything. Absolutely. Oh, that guy was funny. I mean, and, and I was just, you know, I was lucky to meet a lot of the guys back in that day. You know, like I said, the superstar Billy Grahams, the Brunos, the, the Jimmy Snookas, the, you know, Dick, uh, uh, Wahoo McDaniels, the Bruiser Brodies, and all those guys like that, man. I mean, it was, it was, and it was an honor. Jose Lothario, you know, back in the Texas territory. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, it was sure. an honor. You know, it was just, and I, I, I do I, have a, a question about that actually. You, you work, you still live in the area near where the Sportatorium was, and I have to ask you, a few months ago we did kind of a tribute to Global because it was 20 years since it started. Right. Um, basically we just did a kind of a tribute to it, and why do you think maybe people like me still think so fondly of the company? Because if you go back, and I actually have about every episode on, on DVD now that I've uh-huh. pieced together, and you know, I go back and watch it, and it, it's still good, but why do I remember it being just this amazing thing that, that, that you know, stood toe-to-toe with WWE, even though it was clearly a much smaller company? Right. Well, it was just, the, it was, did you ever get to see it, or were you ever in the Sportatorium? I was never in the Sportatorium. I, I, that's one of my biggest regrets. I never Oh, heard. my God. It was that, that place was built for wrestling. It was a, just a pit. And I, you know, and I tell people, you know, that, that, that building was just like a one-story building. That the, the, the ring was underground. It went... That was like a pit. So when you walked in, it was dug in, and that the the you went down into the ground. Wow! So it's like an underground type deal with a just a metal roof type thing over it. It was, I mean, phenomenal. It was built for rest. You know, all the way around, all four sides were you know uh, chairs, you know, and seats and stuff like that. And the people could touch you, and and you could interact with the fans. I mean, there were no rails. There were no, you know. You came out of the dressing room, you came out from where the, the dressing rooms were, from where the concession stands are, so you actually had to walk through the crowd. Oh, wow. So didn't know yeah. That. Yeah. I mean, they had security there around you, but you actually walked through the crowd. The, the, if you came out of the dressing room door and you looked to your, to your right, there was a concession stand right there. Wow. And That's you came out of that, that um, porthole, you know, the porthole where the, the thing was around where everybody sat. And it was it was a neat thing, man. And and there was a lot of camaraderie there. And I learned a lot of stuff from guys like Dick, Mur- you know, Dick Murdoch, Black Bar, uh, Grizzly Smith, probably the greatest mind in professional wrestling, in my opinion, Jake's dad. Yeah, there you go. And, and uh, you know, just it was neat getting to see all that, man. Just getting to work there. I was good friends with the Von Erics. I grew up with Kerry and those guys. They were much older, but uh, you know, I knew them. And I and Kerry, when I was playing ball at TCU, he'd come watch me play football and. You know, I got to go on the road with Terry at a, at a later, you know, when I got older. But, you know, just a lovely guy. And the people, the guys back then, there was no animosity. There was no jealousy. It was just like, you know, they knew the role and they knew that if I get over or you get over, whoever gets over, we're going to make money. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, who gets over. Let's get somebody over and let's do it the way it was meant to be. And let's all make money. We all made money because, you know, your time came and went, and they understood that. I have two questions left for you, and uh, one of the words you just used was animosity, and God, I hope you don't have any towards me after I ask this. Um, <laughs> your name comes up a little bit uh, with a certain female of the business, and you could choose to decline to comment, but any comments on uh, Missy Hyatt? I feel sorry for her, man. Honestly, do. You know, I mean, I, I feel honestly feel sorry for that that girl. You know, for her to say what she said, and I mean, and she knows, she knows what was it. The whole deal with me and Missy Hyatt was a work. Really, it was a whole. It was a work. We worked together on territories in New York. I never dated her. I never had anything to do with her. So, to say what she said about it, I mean, I was, I had, I had a girlfriend who was, who was my wife. I mean, we, you know, why would I mess with someone like that when I had a beautiful person at home? You know, I have a son. I mean, and that was the thing was is. 
when that came out, it was the whole relationship was a work. Wow, really? So that, that yeah, it was, it was a work. It was the whole thing was a work. We were working on the East Coast, and that was it. Yep. Talk to Scott Epstein. Ask him. He'll tell you it was a, it was a work. I mean, <laughs> it's a joke, and that's why for her to say something like that was just like, wow, yeah. you know? And I feel sorry. I mean, if, they, if that's what it takes to sell her book and she thinks that she needs that to make money, God bless her. You know, and, and, and you know, I wish her the best. I know I have no ill feelings. You know, I have no ill feelings for anybody that says anything about me or gets on the computer and types anything bad about me. It's just like, you know, you can say what you want. You know, the difference is be a man or be a woman and say it to my face. There you go. And uh, now, I guess the final question I have for you is, you know, it's been, first of all, I want to say it's been great talking to you, and this exceeded expectations. I knew it would be good, but I have really enjoyed it. It's been fun, so I hope you've had some fun, too. Oh, I've had a great time. Uh, my final question for you is basically, what would you like to say to your fans? And kind of coinciding with that, what do you think um, the legacy will be for Scott Putsky in the wrestling uh, Well, the legacy won't be much because I didn't get to do everything that I was capable of doing at the time. I mean, unless they were to bring me back now. I mean, I'm in better shape now than I was then. then. <laughs> but, I mean, the thing is, is, you know, I just never really got to showcase my talent. You know, be, be it what it is, you know, that's what it was. You know, I enjoyed the fans, and if it wasn't for the fans, the road would have sucked. I mean, the people were so genuinely nice, and, and you know, I, I made a lot of friends in this business both you know, the boys and fans. I mean, the fans were so great, and I enjoyed talking to them, and, and I enjoyed trying to entertain them. You know, and what I, if, if I entertained you, you know, I'm, I'm glad, and if I didn't, I'm sorry. You know, I did my best with what I had and what what they allowed me to do, but, you know, I, I have no ill feelings for this business. I love this business, and I'd love to see this business continue, but in order for it to continue, it's got to evolve, and it's got to evolve into something that's real, and, and you know, we can only we can only pretend for a while it's got to get real. I mean, that's just, that's my opinion. Like I said, for the third time, opinions are like assholes and everyone got it. But, you know, God bless everyone. I enjoyed, you know, my time and, and you guys were great and I had a really good time, man. And I hope, you know, we can do this again. Well, anytime you have anything to promote, anytime you decide you want to just come on and shoot the shit, just give us a call. We'd love to have you on. I really appreciate it. And honestly, I'm not, I'm not shooting smoke anywhere. I, I really did enjoy this. This was a lot of fun. Oh, I had a, I had a blast with you guys, man. I mean, I told it like it was, and that's just you know I'm, that's just how I am. I'm not going to candy coat anything, and and I have nothing to hide. You know, I have no, nothing to gain or nothing to to lose from it. So you know, like I said, God bless you guys. God bless all the fans, and and just you know, enjoy, man. Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio, right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com, and I guess right now I kind of feel like grabbing a cigarette and kind of smoking it. That's the first interview we've done in a while, and what I love to do, honestly, while I love the Hogan interviews and, and the Flair interview and all those kind of big guest interviews that's going to bring in the listeners just because of who they are, I truly get a bigger kick out of interviews like Black Bart, like Rip Rogers, and like Scott Putsky that are not necessarily the hugest names in the business that we'll ever hear but their story is just so interesting, and I just get a feeling about them that they're going to give me a great interview, and, man, that was awesome. I really enjoyed that. 